Hi, my name is Eddie White, and I'm the uh, I'm the president of the English Language Testing Society, and uh, we're starting to uh, host some uh, assessment literacy webinars, and uh, this is the the beginning of them starting um, starting today. So, uh, everybody, the first thing I'm going to do is is get into screen share mode here, and um, just show you um, just some basic information um, about um, just just some things about um, about um, assessment and, and talking about some of the fundamental things. So today's webinar, we're getting into some fundamental principles um, about assessment. And I was putting together the slideshow and I, I found this slide that, and, and it's just that, that message about fundamentals don't change. And I think it's, it's, a, good, it's a good reminder. And I, I put that, and it's kind of why I put it in there. I was, I was having a disagreement with a colleague, I remember a year or so ago, we we're talking about best practices in assessment and he was talking about best practices changing and I agreed to some degree, some degree but, but the fundamental assessment things, I mean, fundamentals don't change and they remain the same over the years and, and for good reason. I just wanted to uh, remind you of something that I put in the uh, initial uh, English Digest that we did and I, I kind of like this quote from Douglas and He's reminding us that I mean, basically, a test is it's, it's a measuring device, right? And and uh, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a three hour, whether it's a three hour TOEFL test or four hours or whatever, or you know, it's a quiz that you're putting together for the classroom. You're you're measuring you're measuring something. So uh, it's it's a good uh, reminder, I think. So a big part of what we're doing is is um, talking about assessment literacy. And when when I do teacher training, usually. If, uh, a lot of my background is working with with in service or pre service teachers and and we talk about uh, assessment literacy and I like this definition from the New Zealand Ministry of Education and so they say that their definition is about assessment literacy, knowing about basic principles of sound assessment practice, um, developing and using assessment methods and techniques, and then just familiarity with standards of quality and assessment and I kind of like this definition. And there is multiple ones out there. I, I like this definition because it's quite broad and it covers large scale testing, but it also covers the things that teachers are doing in their classrooms or, or um, program administrators are, are doing um, in, their, in their language programs. Okay, people this morning were surprised that I hit them with a quiz in the very beginning. And they were like, really at five in the morning, but you guys are fine. I, I know you, you were expecting this and could see it coming, okay. So here's the quiz, or here's the first part of it. Which key assessment print principles are defined below? Okay, so I'm giving you the definition and you're gonna tell me about what the principle is. First one is about um, consistent, dependable results. Um, correspondence between uh, features of the target language. Next one is related to time. Number four, the effects of assessment on classroom teaching and learning. Number five, uh, inferences made are appropriate, et cetera, or not. Okay, there are the five principles. Now, uh, sorry, there are, there are the five definitions. Anybody wanna take a shot at these? Except Tani, don't, Tani, you're, you're, you're not allowed to answer because we work together. What do you think? Anybody? Or are you taking a guess at one or two of them? Is number one reliability? It could be. It, it could. might be. I just, that's, that's, my, that's my evasive answer for not giving an answer. Okay. What else? Anybody? Number two is authenticity. Ah, okay. What about number three? Oh, practicality. Ah, and four? Wash back. All right, and the last one. Learning outcomes. Ah, uh, could be. But validity. No. Yeah, the last one, that's right. Last one is validity. I think I can. Validity. Okay. Yeah, here we go here. So reliability, authenticity, yeah, just, you know, there's correspondence with how, how, how it's actually used in, in, in the target language, practicality, washback, and validity. So those are, those, those are some of the fundamental principles, basically, that, that we're talking about today. Okay, quiz part two. All right, take a look at this. So this is true or false, no? 
Uh, by the way, when, when I, I, I realize this when I'm teaching, I give my students a quiz in the class. And if you ask, you give them a quiz and it's true or false or whatever. And if you ask them to compare their answers, it takes them like four seconds. They just show each other and that's it, it's over. But if you ask them, how many are true or how many are false, it works much better because then they start discussing things. Three are true and four are false. And then, then they have to, they have to um, agree and see, see what's true, what's false. So take a look, how many of these are false? Having uniform rubrics adds to the reliability of a test. Most common problem for teachers is giving a final grade. Valid test measures what it should, no contaminating variables. The most, most formal and pre prestigious type of assessment is formative. Number five, and six. And the last one. One of the problems of with true false items on a test, they only test productive knowledge. Now, again, the question is how many of these are false? So if you had a hundred dollars that you had to make a bet on, what 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 number are you gonna bet here? I, I'm I'm gonna put I'm gonna put Perry on the spot here. Perry, how many it just how many of these are false? And if you're not if you're not sure, you can guess. My brain doesn't work that way, but uh, I would say uh, uh, three are false. Uh huh. Anybody else? Anybody disagree with that? Is he right? Is this? I, I feel like I'm in teaching mode now. As soon as I get one answer, then I'll say to the whole class, "Is he right or is he wrong? Is he right? There's three, or maybe there's more. There's five. Five of them are false. There we go. Well, come on, he's Stake out a position here. Gabriel, what do you what do you think? How many are false? Oh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No. Uh, number one. True. This is two false. Uh, four false. That's two false. So should I was not true good most questions are surprised these and then false six false three false one of the problems was true so uh, how many have we got did you say three i said three false hold on it's number seven one of the problems with true false is the test on the test is that they only test productive knowledge uh i'd say that's false too that's four false uh -huh. i say four You're right, Perry. Three, three of them. Anybody else who, who said three? I knew three of them were false. The question yeah. is, did I know which three were false? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, <laughs> hey, as soon as I put him on the spot, he just says, "I'm going with three. It's whatever. I'm going with three. I just, and I, I use this quiz sometimes with with my students in class. And I guess to some degree, I'm 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 doing two things. I'm reminding people about some key ideas, and I guess I'm also doing a little bit of assessment literacy checking too. Number four, the most formal and prestigious type of assessment, of course, is usually it's I mean, summative. Summative assessment, the assessment that's generating scores and grades, that's what people are very focused on. And sometimes the formative assessment, where the, where the focus is on giving feedback, is, is um, and it's very important, but sometimes that gets left behind a little bit. Good multiple choice questions, of course, are can be very difficult to design. And, and number seven is you get the distinction between uh, productive knowledge and, and, and the difference between the productive skills of, of uh, writing and speaking, where students are producing or test takers are producing language. And the other side, you have the receptive skills. We're receiving language, it's uh, listening and reading. And true, false, mostly they're testing receptive skills. Usually we use them for re testing reading, testing listening. Okay, so that's, that's why number seven is false. Okay. And then I just have one more quick check and reminder of, of you. So we would say that there are four main types of language tests. Okay. And you probably know what they are, I'm sure, especially if I give you one of them. I'll give you giving giving you one of the four. The first one is placement tests. What, what anybody? What, what are the other main kinds of, of language tests? Assessment. Diagnostic. No, we're looking for a specific type here. Okay. Anybody? Proficiency. Proficiency tests. Pro progress. Progress tests. Um, uh, not really. We so proficiency tests, diagnostic tests, proficiency tests, and there's one more. What? 
What's classroom assessment? We talk about classroom assessment. Usually, but the, the more, I guess what, more, more formal term for classroom assessment is what? Anybody? Performance-based or achievement? Yeah, achievement testing. And just a, just a quick explanation of them. So if we're placing students in programs, we, we give students placement tests. Sometimes we design them ourselves within a program. And sometimes we use external tests also. We used to use ITEP as, as part of our placement testing. Diagnostic testing is usually the, you know, the, the, the test that teachers will give to students in new classes to figure out who are the strong and weak students. Proficiency testing, of course, is, is those large scale tests that, that um, are determines people's overall proficiency. And it says here, the test, are, it's regardless of any, any training or anything. So proficiency tests are completely kind of divorced from uh, any learning outcomes or programs or training, right? And then achievement testing is what happens with the classroom, right? As it says here, achievement testing, achievement of what? Achieving learning outcomes, right? It's all about learning outcomes or learning objectives. And um, with, with the English Language Testing Society, I mean, generally we're focused on those two areas, kind of achievement testing that's going on in the classroom. And then of course you have a large scale uh, proficiency testing that's happening also. Okay. All right. So just moving, <laughs> moving out of my, my, my quiz mode. So um, I, I decided that when I was doing the seminars, I, I wanted to provide people with, with a reading or something that we could, we could focus on. And, and the one that's connected with this one is just from this book by uh, Douglas Brown and H.C. Brown and, and uh, Bayer Grammar. They're out of, um, I think they were at San Francisco, San Francisco State University in their master's program. This book has been in the third edition now, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, and it's probably one of the best books out on the market there, certainly about classroom assessment. So in that book, they say, so how do you know if a test is a good one or not? And they say, you, can, you know that a test is a good one or not by focusing on these, these cardinal criteria for evaluating a test, right? And those cardinal criteria, so the principles can be applied to assessments of all kinds, whether it's a large scale test or, or something going on in the classroom. And they're also, we can use them to, to design good tests, okay? And then you know what they are now. So these are, these are the identified as, as the five key principles. By the way, if, if anybody's interested, I, I see some of you are making notes. If anybody's interested in having the slideshow, just send me an email. You send me an email later or something and I can, I can send this to you. Um, so these are the, the five key assessment principles. I'm working with a, a colleague of mine, someone I know is, He's, they produce large scale uh, tests and he's, they're producing a new test and he's asking me to, to take a look at it. And I'll probably review it next week. These are the things I'll be looking for. And then when I'm, when I'm evaluating that test or if I'm making a test. So these are the five principles and I'll run through them a little bit and we can discuss them. So the principles can be expressed in, in, in a question form. Validity is, does it measure what we really want to measure? Okay, that's the key question with validity. Uh, is all the work being consistently marked to the same standard? Okay, with reliability, and then we get into rubrics, get closely tied to reliability. Uh, practicality, is it, is it easy to administer? Uh, does the assessment have positive effects on learning and teaching, washback? And sometimes tests, and even large scale tests, they can have either positive or, or negative effects on, on, uh, on what happens in the classroom or, or on the learner. And then authenticity, are students asked, asked to perform real world tasks, okay? And so the, the, the tasks that students are, are doing on tests, are they, are they asked to perform real world tasks? So we'll talk about, um, I'll just do a quick run through of, of each one of these and we'll, we'll stop in the middle and, and discuss some of them also. So first one is validity. And again, that we have that question is, does it measure what we really want to measure, okay? and and. Validity is, is, as you see from the reading, and there was like four or five different types of validity, and it's, there's some complexity to it, and it's also the most important principle. And the other thing about validity is, is this, it, there's a defini definition here, but one, one of the key points is that the decision-making, the inferences that we make from somebody's test score, is it appropriate, is it meaningful, is it, is it, is it useful? And, and let me give you a quick example. If I work in an administrative office at the university and I've got to make some decisions about accepting undergrad students or not, and, and this test taker is submitting a test score, it's a 20 minute test that he did on his telephone, okay? Now, 
is it valid for me to accept that test score and accept them into a university program in a university setting? And lots of people would say, no, that is not a valid assessment that prepares someone for, for a university setting. So just, I find it, 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 it easy to just kind of remember those two things about validity. The first one is, is the test itself valid? The, the, the tasks, the things are on it. And the second one is the decisions that are being made based on the test scores, are they also valid too? Okay. Um, content validity is, is basically this key idea that um, basically students are asked to perform the behavior that's being measured. Okay. So I, I remember having a, a teacher ask me once, it was a reading test, a reading final. And she said, Eddie, on the reading final, do students have to read? And my response was, yes, it's a reading test. They, they have to be doing reading, right? You're, you're directly testing what it is that, um, that you're trying to measure. So for example, a, a test of a student's ability in speaking, if you test somebody's speaking skills, then they have to produce some language, okay? And, you know, a, a pencil and paper test doesn't do that. In, in our program here at the University of Arizona, I was talking to someone in, in the Spanish department, and in the Spanish department, they, they assess people's speaking skills and they teach people to speak Spanish, but the final exam was a, was a pencil and paper test which is of course is not a valid way of, of assessing the, those skills. So another way of thinking about content validity is you're considering the difference between direct testing and, and indirect testing. And again, with direct testing, you're trying to involve students in, in or, or test takers into performing the, performing the target tasks. If you're involved with large scale testing, for example, one of the challenges is assessing speaking, right? And, and, and getting people to produce a language, a, a language sample of speaking, especially if it's something that you're trying to do live, that can be very challenging. Indirect testing is asking students to not perform the task itself, but something related. For example, if you're testing listening skills and you're asking students to write a summary, write a summary of what you heard, it's kind of an indirect way of doing it. So one of the things that we try to do is, is directly test um, what it is that we're trying to, trying to measure. Validity is the most important one, right? So it's the most significant principle. And you can have a test that can be practical, reliable, all those other things. If it's not valid, as the American, that American expression is all bets are off. I mean, if it's not valid, then it can't be a good test. And it's why it's, it's the gold standard, right? So in terms, of, um, in terms of reviewing a test. Okay, moving, moving ahead quickly, we're talking about reliability. Is, is all the work consistently marked to the same standard, okay? That is the key issue with, with reliability. And particularly when you're assessing the productive skills, speaking and writing, is, is all the work being um, um, assessed at the same standard. So a reliable test is, is consistent or dependable. And in the reading I gave you, I mean, they use the example of, if, if you're giving the same test to the same student on, on different occasions, the scores should be similar. That doesn't happen very often, but, um, Myself and Tani, my colleague, who's we, we've been working together on, on developing some proficiency testing at the university here. And we had an example of a student or a test taker. They took our test four times, but it was four different versions of the test, different readings, different writings, everything. And they took four different versions, but their, but their test scores were similar. The test scores were very similar at all times. So for us, it, it kind of gives us a, an indication that the, the test is reliable if the student is producing some similar scores, okay? The reading explains test reliability in, in terms of what makes a test unreliable. So the factors that contribute to the unreliability of a test. And some of them are related to the student, rater reliability, test administration reliability, and, and just the test itself, okay? And with students, so things that, that cause, um, you know, unreliability of a test score because of students. And you get students that are, they're sick, they're tired, they're having a bad day, the dog ran away, whatever, they're anxious. And there, you get some other um, physical or psychological factors, right? And sometimes it could be their, their test making skills. But these, these kind of things, as, as the reading says, it, 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 um, you get this distinction between the score they produce and, and their true score, what they're able to actually do, you know? We, we, I remember we had a student who came in, we did a placement test with him. He actually came in from Brazil and he was placed, I mean, he was placed in a low, uh, low uh, level in our program. 
And I was talking to him a few weeks later and I was like, in his English, his, his oral proficiency was very good. And I said, well, what happened? He said, he was asleep and somebody woke him up and said, come on, you got to do a test. And he went over and he did the test. He didn't do very well on it. And it wasn't a, a good reflection of his, his true score. So sometimes that can happen. Other times, uh, um, reliability comes from just the people doing the rating, okay? And then you get human error, subjectivity, bias that comes into the scoring process, right? So inter-rater unreliability, you get different scoring going on, which is why, I mean, the, um, the large-scale test companies, I mean, people who, I mean, they're hiring people to, to score their tests, and you get calibration, you get reliability, you get training going on because they're, they're trying to establish that inter-rater reliability. And sometimes it's, it's not consistent because lack of attention, inexperience, sometimes biases. And then intra-rater reliability is you just have, and usually this is with one teacher. So you have, usually there's only one teacher in the classroom. There's only one person scoring the test, right? But if you've got 20 essays to score or whatever, then sometimes, you know, the teacher gets tired, has some bias, or that one student that you don't like and he doesn't like you, and, <laughs> right? As, but the essay is really good, and so then what are you gonna do? So those things, the, the rater itself causes some unreliability. And very quickly, the next two is, it could be the, the administration of the test, the environment, the noise, photocopying, it's not bright, there's too many, there's too many people around, et cetera. I was talking to, I did an interview with, um, I do proficiency testing for the university for J1 visiting scholars. I interviewed this, this man in Bangladesh and his, his English was very strong, very good skills. But he told me he did the TOEFL test and he got, a, he got a low score on the speaking part. And I said, why? He said he was in a room full of 50 people, everybody with headsets and you're responding to, to a prompt or a microphone. And he just, you know, he had a hard time with it, but he obviously was was much better and I could see it when I, when I interviewed him. So sometimes the test administration can cause problems. And the last one, it could be the test itself. The test itself can cause measurement errors, okay? So if the test is too long, it's a three hour test and okay, now write an essay, right? And, and students get fatigued. And sometimes it just can be, can be poorly written. The test items themselves can be poorly written and that can make a, a, a test unreliable also, okay? So, Eddie, can we ask questions? Or? Yes, I'm, I'm just about to move to it right now, Perry, and we can ask questions too, which is perfect timing. So um, it just those two, those two questions about, so the two issues of validity and reliability. And I kind, of, I, I kind of like this general idea about just challenge choices and consequences. So I was asking people to consider in your context, uh, what challenge do you face in applying these principles? What choices do you make or what choices have other people made dealing with validity and reliability? And, and what are some of the consequences of, of the choices that you've made? So maybe we can, we can spend a few minutes um, discussing those things after we deal with Perry's question. Yes, Perry, go ahead. I was just curious about if you run across, uh, is there an issue with cultural reliability? Forget about content, putting content uh, aside, content aside, yeah. this, do certain cultures take do well on certain tests and other cultures just don't do well on those tests? Um, perhaps, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm quantifying a little bit. Just, okay, a couple of things to tell you. I, I, I remember going to Columbia and I was doing some teacher training there and, and uh, the teachers were telling me, yes, Betty, but you know, you don't really understand the students here in Columbia and they're, they're this and they're that and whatever. And I said that, I, I said, I teach students from around the world. And I said, when, I said when, I'm, when I'm teaching, for example, I said, I don't care which culture you're from, it doesn't matter. I'm teaching a writing class. I'm teaching you how to write paragraphs. It doesn't matter if you're from Saudi Arabia or Brazil or whatever. It's like, are you learning what I'm teaching? So in that sense that I, I told people that it's, it's um, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. But, but Perry, I know the same thing that, and we've worked with lots of Arab students, for example, and, and students that are coming from the Arab culture and the Gulf Arabs. And we often see that they have very strong oral skills, right? But um, sometimes the academic skills, and maybe they, they haven't had the educational background, you, you see some weaknesses. So you, you, can, you can see some differences, I think. And part of that is cultural. 
you know, and if, if people are coming from a very uh, oral culture, for example, anybody else? It's a good question. And anybody else want to jump in? So Perry is asking about whether whether cultural affects test performance. I would say that it does because we've had experiences with Asian students. I'm thinking specifically of a Korean student who came with a, a more than a 600 on his TOEFL and he could not put together a complete sentence uh, in English. Uh, it was really very, very disturbing. And yeah. I, I, think, I think that depends on, as you pointed out, the emphasis in the society. Uh, yeah. Right, Arabs are an oral society, whereas Asians are a, 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 a review and give back information or correct grammar kinds of things. So yeah, yeah I think that makes a big difference. Yeah. But I guess Perry, in terms of making tests though and stuff, we try to, we try to, I guess minimize. I mean, one of the things that in general, it, it's a great principle. It doesn't matter what kind of testing you're doing, you're trying to maximize objectivity and minimize subjectivity, right? So mm -hmm. there, it's almost impossible to remove the subject, subjective, subjective element because of the simple fact that we're we're human beings and there's always some kind of element of subjectivity to it, but. We try to minimize it as much as possible. Just a quick example. When I, I remember teaching in Vancouver in the program there, and the final exam, it was a reading, and students had to write an essay about it. But the reading was about um, adoptions in China, and people from North America would go to China and, 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 and have adoptions. And it was all about that and, and Chinese culture and the adoptions and stuff. But I thought that test was biased in favor of the Chinese students and it biased against a lot of the Arab students that were in the class, for example, right? So just something like that. I mean, I, I saw it and I was like, I, there's no way I would have that for, for an exam because I thought it introduced some bias. So good Thank question, you. Perry. Back to the bigger one, everybody. Just any, any Can issue? I, Watch out. What, you know, go ahead, Tony. Sorry. I just wanted to make a comment about uh, Perry's question. I was thinking Please. here, cold side. Sorry, Tony, you're, you're freezing on us. I, I work with Tony here in... Uh, yeah, at one o'clock, it's... <laughs> Sorry, Tony. Yeah, um, Tony is my colleague from Brazil. I'm sure he has very inter something interesting to say. Tony, maybe we can, maybe we can come back. I'll say later, yes. No, no, no. You're, you're back now. Maybe, maybe you're fine, please. Okay, okay. So I was just going to say, content aside, the one way that we can control for cultural uh, bias too is by, of course, making our students familiar with the type of test that they are taking. So if one, if they are more, oh, these people know how to take this test better. So by making everybody familiar with the type of test that you're giving, um, not the content, like leaving the content aside, but making sure that um, students are familiar with the test, then we can control a little bit for that. Yeah, that's a good point. Very, yeah. very good point. Uh, yeah. Uh, Eddie, I, I don't want to dominate it. I have one more oh, please. question. Uh, how do you review a test and determine its validity based upon your review? I, I just have no idea how you go about doing that. Well, I, I mean, just very quickly, I mean, the first thing is like, I mean, um, if somebody gives me a test and is, is whatever, so can you look at the test? Before you even look at the test, was, the question is, what are you testing? What? What are you testing? What skills are you testing? I'm testing, okay, I'm testing writing. You're testing writing only? Okay, I'm only testing writing. Good, and, that, and then you start looking at it. And if it has a reading component, for example, there's a, there's a lot of reading going on, then you've got a validity problem right there because you're getting different things getting mixed in. So the, the big question is, that, what is it that you're testing with that task or with the test itself? And are you measuring what you're trying to measure? And it's very easy to start measuring something else. Right, a teacher. For, I mean, for example, just a, a writing test. It doesn't have to be a teacher, but you get a writing test, and the rubric has is, the rubric mentions critical thinking. So critical thinking. Are you measuring that? Really? How do you measure that? When the, in, in, in an essay, and you're looking for that. So th those kind of things that, if it comes in, is that, are you measuring what what is it you're exactly trying to measure? And if you if you're able to define that clearly, it's much easier to determine whether the test is valid or not. So I guess that's kind of what I would say. Everybody, just what, what challenges are you facing? What, what issues do you have related to reliability and validity? Susan, please. So I teach um, <clears throat> listening, speaking and listening to higher level uh, in our program. 
And the problem that I've come across is, is exactly about this, to me, this issue is um, we'll have inference questions from a, a 20 minute listening passage. And I mean, a lot of the inferences are might even to your earlier um, conversation be cultural or also, you know, so designing the question so you're not just act, asking the students to regurgitate, regurgitate facts or little details, yeah. but so that the questions are, are designed to actually, un that they're going to understand a lecture in a yeah. college, in a university. That's hard for me. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 testing academic skills is, is hard. And, and one of those ac academic skills about, about assessing listening, one, one of the things that we, we, I've seen, and you could do sometimes, for example, and you can do this in reading too, and, and same with the listening test, is if you ask the students a question, for example, which of the following would the lecturer or the speaker agree with or support? And you have five or six sentences there and, and you know, and, and they should have picked up on these three or four from that listening and from what they understood. But yeah, um, yeah quite challenging, I mean, um, for, for assessing listening. Yeah, well, that's a great suggestion. And I was just gonna say, if it's a, you know, fill in the blank, it can get dicier. Yeah. I think your point of giving them a choice is is probably more clear cut and fairer, maybe yeah. more valid. And and uh, Susan, you could you can get into things like writing a summary. So, okay, listen. If if it's in, if you're getting to write a summary, but you have clearly ident I've done this. You've I've clearly identified the key content that I'm listening for. And if the speaker, if the speech is, it's clearly organized, right? And maybe it's like okay, and he's talking about there are four things that are important in X. And I've got, I mean, I'm like, now this, I know the students need, this is the key thing I need to, them to be able to pick up on. So it's an indirect way of getting it, but it's, that's, that's a possible way of, of assessing those skills also. Yeah. Um, Susan, I have a suggestion. Um, the TOEFL, the, there's one part of the TOEFL listening that they do a lot of like academic listening and lectures. And I really like the types of questions that they ask about the lecture and what and one of them is what actually uh, what Eddie was suggesting. So I would look into samples for the TOEFL and then just just do the same type of task that they're asking. Yeah, that's a right. good suggestion. Yeah, it's a good point, honey. And it's it's yeah. a good it's a good general pr principle. Some things that happens also. I mean, some what happens with with language teaching and something that happens in 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 um, in the classroom comes out of copying what are the things that, that, that are happening with large scale testing. So sometimes we do that too. Yeah. My Anybody only else? quick, quick follow up is if Please. I do, thank you. If I do have the students do a summary, I, I want to make sure that I'm not assessing them on their writing ability, you know? So, I mean, as long as they give me the key ideas and, and whoever's rating their responses are not, Oh, did you have a good topic sentence? Did, you know, so, I want to make sure that the, the graders yeah, are. And, and, and again, that's where you get, you know, you, it becomes invalid, right? If you start assessing their, their, uh, their writing skills, their writing ability, in, uh, you know. So one of the things about validity, it's, 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 it's sometimes it's not all or nothing, but say they're strong or weak, and you start including things like that. Uh, Susan, one of the things that you can do, and I've done this before, is that I just have a simple rubric, and I will say, here are the main ideas, here are the things I'm expecting people to pick up, in this summary. And I'll kind of identify in bullet points. And then I'll just have a, f a five point scale all the way from excellent, good, okay, whatever. And then I can just quickly see that, yep, you got all of these, you get the five points or whatever. So you can, you can create a simple rubric that will help you score it and, and, and keep, things, um, keep things valid and reliable that way, I think too. And the students see the rubric ahead of yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Anybody else, any um, reliability, validity, challenges, issues? You get into the issues like with, with, um, with cheating also and test security, that's when you get into rely, uh, validity stuff too. Um, I'm from, I'm in Ohio. Go ahead. United please. States and um, with the, University of Dayton, and we sorry, this have is, moved. This is Nicole, right? This is Nicole. Yes, I'm sorry. I thought my name Nicole. could be seen. Yeah, please Nicole. go ahead. So, and I'm the associate program manager, so I'm the one that reviews all the curriculum and assessments. And so we are running into our final exams, and I review all final exams before they're administered. Yeah. 
And the number one I look for, number one um, item I look at is, is reliability. And now that we've moved to remote virtual learning, the reliability has just plummeted using this online platform service or, uh, that we have learning management service. So it's, um, it's been difficult because a lot of our teachers have wanted to do the true false, yeah. uh, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And it's been very difficult to adjust and account for the reliability online because everything's not being, and I try to try to help them with that, but they don't see, I don't seem to know, they seem to want to tend to do it the easy way because they say, well, it's a computer and it's going to take them longer to type and, and they use these kinds of reasons, but yeah, it's been difficult. I don't know if that others have had difficulty if they're online for their final exams or any exams. For that. Nicole, do you mean that the, the, the key issue is the validity that it's measuring what you're trying to measure or because the reliability is just the, the consistency in scoring or it's a bit of both maybe. It's a bit of both. Yeah. It really is a bit of both. So yeah. some of the teachers they're using um, our learning platform system, which you put the question in and it, you, you identify the answer. And then the system is saying whether the student got the answer right or not based on the answer the teacher has identified. So there's no, did they give me what they should have given me? Were they close? It's like, you have to match that answer. So sometimes mm -hmm. that doesn't, I don't feel that always identifies the student's skill. It doesn't leave any leeway. Yeah. And, and other teachers have everyone write it out and then email it to them and then they're trying to test it that way. So you have, I have this reliability and validity issues going through multiple courses through an entire program yeah. on different angles. So I don't and, know if anybody's the, had any thoughts about that with it being online. Yeah. Um, anybody about I'm, I'm just curious, do you have, uh, I assume you're talking about an English, this is an assumption, English program with different levels of proficiency, is this? Uh, Correct. Okay. And yes. so there are written, very specific learning, learning objectives for each one of those levels. And Correct. now that uh, your levels have been combined, more than likely, if you're like a lot of English language programs, uh, I'm just curious how you've been able to uh, adapt uh, the learning objectives with the, I'm assuming you've combined classes because when you have 50 students, uh, you may have five classes, you've got 10 students, you don't have five classes. No, actually we have been fortunate enough to allow our levels to be uncombined. So okay. excellent. the students in level four writing are all in level four writing and they're at that proficiency level of a B1. Nicole, uh, how, I mean, how standardized is the program in terms of the assessment, in terms of teachers are, are everybody is kind of doing the same thing or should be doing the same thing assessment wise, or are, are teachers working individually and creating their own instruments, creating their own tests? So at this point, especially now, the instruments, their own tests, they can create their own tests based on the content that they've delivered during the term. Yeah. Um, but we do have standardized rubrics throughout for a writing, for instance. Yeah. Um, the the or communication class has a standardized rubric for assessing um, those speaking skills. Yeah. The most difficult one has been the listening and note taking courses. Yeah. And the reading courses for some reason. The yeah. the reading teachers, oh sorry. The reading teachers tend to want to put all these True, false, true, false, true, false. The, the reading above says this. Yeah. And they're typically more inference questions than they are actual re, you know, regurgitation of content and details. It's like yeah. the reader, the, 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 the read, the speaker of the, of the reading, the writer says this, and if you look for it, it's not there. They have to infer that's what the writer's saying. And it's a true and false. And I, I'm finding that to be, less reliable and valid truthfully if that's what they can do because it's not really testing their comprehension of it it's testing yeah. their ability to infer what the reader the writer is saying so yeah i mean there 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 are i mean 
it can be uh, valid and reliable, but it, it, it's just the issue with, with uh, particularly with assessing reading and listening. That's why I mean we call them the, the invisible skills, right? Because you mm -hmm. can't you can't see them. So it, much more challenging, and, and particularly I think in, in um, when you're when you're testing some of this stuff online, and especially with reading, and, and how do you know the student doesn't have a phone, their phone nearby, or they're checking the vocabulary online? So yeah, there there's there is definitely a bunch of associated challenges, but as soon as you have some concerns about whether those things are going on, and then it's like, well, then you have, you have validity issues, right? Because right. I'm a student in your program and my test scores are great. And somebody is saying, you know, hey, look at Eddie's test scores. You see how great he is? And you say, yeah, do you see how much he's using his phone when he's doing the test or, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, and no, no clear answers, Nicole, but you know, um, just hopefully we're giving you some ideas or at least yeah. things to pay things to pay attention to. Everybody, um, let me. I want to exit screen share mode. Oh, sorry, I did exit screen share mode. I would just want to get back into screen share mode just for a couple of minutes so I can, um, I can just finish off just mentioning the the last few principles and I can wrap up and and we can get back into um, into more of a discussion here. And actually, sorry, I'm just going to skip ahead to that last part. So, I mean, I was asking you about what makes, a, what makes a good test. And then, yeah, so how do you know if a test is a good one or not? And just skipping ahead a little bit. So a good test is, it's one of the issues of practicality. It has to be given with, within administrators' constraints, right? And how much time do people have for, for doing tests? And one of the things that we're, as Self and Tani, for example, we've been working on a test and we're probably gonna be uh, adding a listening component and a listening part, but we also know that that's gonna make the test longer. It's also going to impact our scoring systems and stuff. So practicality becomes a, becomes a big issue with testing. Is it dependable? Is it reliable? We've talked about that reliability. That key thing, does it measure what you want to measure, right? Is the validity issue. We haven't talked about authenticity, but it's uh, the language is the language used on the test is it's kind of representative of real world language use. And and um, let me give you a quick example. So I've seen this where a teacher was was assessing grammar, and uh, they had the students do this. Imagine you're my students in a class. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to say ten sentences. I want you to write the grammatical the the tense that I'm using. For example. I went to see a movie last night and you write simple past, right? And I would read out 10, 10 sentences and you write down what tense I was using. And you think, that's a good test, right? Maybe, but can you imagine a real life situation where you ask to listen to something and, and write down what grammar test it is, right? It's just, it's completely, it's completely inauthentic. Or one of the things that you see, and, and sometimes this happens now with we're getting newer tests that are coming onto the market. And sometimes what the newer tests are saying, we're great because a couple of things. One, um, we're cheaper than the other ones. And number two, we're short. It only takes 20 minutes to do our test, right? But one of the tasks on the test, for example, is identify if this is a word or not. Here's 20 words, 15 of them are say 10 of them are gibberish or gibberish 10 of them are gibberish and 10 of them are actual words and you have to identify which is a word and which is not a word again it's completely inauthentic when when would you have a real life situation where you have to do something like that right so those are the kind of things that we try to do that we, we try to make our tests as as authentic as possible and, and including the tasks that we're using and the last one here was just was just washback which is particularly relevant to classroom teachers. What are the effects of the test? What effects are, is the test having uh, on the learners prior to the test taking, right? Sometimes it can have positive effects or, or negative effects. A quick example, I, I used to use, um, final exams were always, when I was doing a speaking test, final exam was typically a classroom discussion. And we would have classroom discussions or interviews with me. And that will be the final exam. But during the term, during the semester, the students were doing a lot of that. They were doing a lot of interviewing each other, a small uh, group discussion. So the final exam was having a positive impact, a positive effect on, on what was happening in the class. So it's just an example of, of washback. 
voiceback is, I guess, a bit less important for um, um, for large scale testing. So just a, a summary of those those key ideas. Those are the five key assessment principles. And if you keep them in mind, they'll, they'll help you make accurate judgments about the competence of your students or the test takers. And I mean, they also provide useful guidelines for evaluating existing tests and, and, and designing your own. And um, I mean, I, I use these all the time. I mentioned I'm, I'm going to be reviewing a test soon. I'll probably be using these, but also in, in, you know, in terms of preparing or making tests for the classroom. So if we keep these in mind, I think we can, um, um, I mean, they, 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 carry, they can carry us a, a long way and it's good to, I'm sure you're, you're, you're familiar with them and I'm just reminding you about some of them. So um, what about those last three? So the practicality issues, um, uh, authenticity, and also the issue of, of washback. Any, any challenges, problems, issues related to those? can add in for that. Um, I'm Catherine Shabbat. I know my name up there. Is Hi, like, Catherine. But, um, and so I'm actually with the Pearson Test of English. And yep. I just found it so fascinating to, with COVID-19 and how the practicality um, kind of came into play and test takers couldn't go to the actual test center. So, um, you know, testing providers quickly came to at-home testing. And, and so, you know, there was uh, like issues of, could be issues of security, could be issues of yeah. reliability. And I, I just, I'm, it's just a very fascinating kind of to watch and kind of just observe and make better, I guess, hopefully. Yeah. One of, one of the things that we, we do at the university, I'm sure other universities do. So we, we prepared a proficiency test for the university. And, but then it's like security issues. I mean, if I give you a, a reading or writing test, I mean, how do I know that, you know, you're, you're, cause when we, when we started using them, we would have live proctors. Usually the test takers, they were all together and we had a live proctor and we had a proctoring agreement and a whole bunch of protocols and the proctor would watch them and, and sign off on them. And then we could say, okay, those, those test scores are valid. But then, then we get into individual test takers. So what we do is that we use, the, the university has an online proctoring system, this online proctoring company, and they do, they do, they do proctoring for lots of different tests and lots of different departments at the university. So we, we use them now. So for example, if, if you were doing, if you were doing our test now, you would go through the online proctoring first and, and they would be uh, monitoring the, the things that you're doing, but it's, it's a huge challenge. Just, just test, test security wise. Perry, can you maybe comment a little bit? Cause I mean, Perry's oh, yeah. involved with, with ITEP and it, are you it always in terms of test security. And the students, uh, test takers are very ingenious. Yeah, and it's uh, very difficult to stay ahead of them. Uh, and uh, I know we had an issue recently in Columbia. We were testing uh, uh, large numbers of students uh, every other week, and yeah. um, it was even though we have a large number of items, test items. I tell you, it, it, after about the third week, the students had most of those test items, and then we had to scramble to create new test items to uh, to make up for it. So, so it's it's a it's a constant challenge. And uh, I, I used to teach, and when I was a teacher, I always uh, said that if students in my classroom can cheat uh, somehow, that's my fault. So I've got to figure out a way to keep them from cheating. And, yeah. Uh, so that's why we're. It's something we constantly work on at the at, at ITEP. Yeah. Uh, one of the issues, uh, and I'm interested, maybe Nicole, uh, uh, when you have teachers creating their own exams uh, to measure how effective they were during the eight weeks or four weeks or quarter, uh, every teacher wants to look good, and so would you not be tempted as a teacher uh, to create an exam? that would uh, result in high scores on the part of your students uh, when in fact you did a lousy job. <laughs> you did, they didn't yeah. learn very much. So I, how, do you, how do you handle this, uh, Eddie? That, that's a completely different issue where the teacher is being assessed and you get into course evaluations and stuff. And, and that's, I mean, how much does that affect or impact what, what teachers are doing? That's, that's a big issue also, but we, we we rely on the the integrity of the individual teacher, and they they would not 
they would not uh, they would not stoop to modify or make their exam any easier to to look. No, they would no, they would <laughs> stoop to do it. Of course not, but it just might slip. Yeah. <laughs> it might just happen. Uh, yeah. Nicole, have you run across this uh, yourself in your program? Yeah, uh, I, mean, I can we, answer that. We have. Oh, I'm please. sorry, Eddie. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, please, Nicole. So we we have had that, and we have. I've had a I've had a specific teacher that, um, and and I make it. I have to look at. I review almost every exam or test or quiz that goes through some of these classes, and a lot of it's been reused, so it's uh, approved for use and adjusted. But um, you know that rigor in some of those um, assessments sometimes is missing and, um, and and unfortunately you can see that because students pass to the next level and then they start to fail miserably. Mm -hmm. they, ha they don't have the supported skill to, to progress well in that next level. And so we have this kind of check and balance um, usage. But I, one of the ways we've been able to try to avoid that is teacher training, of course, and then having this kind of um, portfolio of assessments within for the textbooks that we use because we change our textbooks every term yeah so having assessments sorry about my pups sorry um, my son walked out here that's why so having a portfolio of assessments that teachers can pull from that have been reviewed have been tested have been used changing some of the you know um, changing the order of the questions sometimes, you know, there's, there's various ways. It is a lot of work, yeah. but putting that test bank in was, has, has assisted me in not having to review every single assessment that teachers are using in the classroom, because to me, that's too much micromanaging. And I, I hate that. Yeah. And I want the teachers to have their ability to have their unique voice and their unique authenticity and what they're doing as well. Yeah. Um, so for me, like I said, the test bank for various textbooks that we use has been helpful for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nicole, just a quick point about, I guess for any program, one of the issues for almost any language program is how much controls do teachers have over the assessments that are going on? And in some programs that teachers have, you know, completely uh, a, a lot of control and a lot of say. And for others, it's, it's much more standardized where, where teachers are expected to, to do certain things. And a big part of it is uh, whether it's successful or not, especially if teachers have a lot more control is just the assessment literacy of the teachers, the assessment literacy of the group and their decision-making is, is key. Gabriel, uh, I'm wondering, I mean, in, in your context, any of those, the, the principles that we're talking about, which, which ones are, are big challenges or issues that you're, you're facing? Right now, uh, similar to Nicole, uh, since we're moving to face-to-face -face classes, to virtual classes, we're, yeah. we're changing our assessment now. And uh, because our classes are different, because yeah. we're moving our course, we're talking about a community of 5,000 students and around 50 wow. teachers, 60 teachers. Um, so, um, last friday we had a meeting and one of the questions that were posed was uh was posed was you know what kind of uh, principles are we keeping in our face-to-face -face cl uh, uh, virtual classes from the face-to-face the -face classes that we need to you know carry on to our assessment you know yeah um uh, and then uh i guess the reliability, uh, security, uh, yeah. because the students are gonna take the tests online. So one of the questions that I posed was, you know, how, how's that gonna work? Because this is the first time students are gonna take the test online. Uh, and we work with the four abilities. Uh, yeah. So how- and as, soon as, as soon as you, if, you're, if you get suspicious that there's some cheating going on or students are sharing answers or whatever, the validity of those test scores is completely gone. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's compromised. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the number of students too that we had yeah. and the number of teachers. Yes, Denise. Denise. So, uh, uh, yeah, I was just, because I taught in the same program. I was just wondering, so how are you guys doing? Because you have the same level, at like five, six different classes, right? Taking classes on Saturday, taking classes during the week. Are you guys still doing the same final exams for everybody, but they're taking it at different times too? So how's that working? 
Yeah, we're planning, but right now we're planning to uh, have the same test for the same level. Uh, and we're keeping all the classes. Yeah. But they're taking it at different times? We don't know yet. We're, we're still that's... figuring out the logistics. That's what it sounds like. That's one of the challenges you're making. You're making some choices about, but but Gabriel, I guess I mean for all of us, I mean, and this is the challenge too. Whether it's the teach, whether teaching or or, or making large scale tests. I mean those those principles, validity, reliability, practicality. I mean they remain challenges for all of us, but they they remain those remain those key principles. And and Gabriel and everybody, I guess whatever decisions that you're making, you still have to keep those things in mind. And you know. Because if you can make things, you can make things simpler or or uh -huh. other other ways. But if you compromise validity, then I mean it's it's almost like you you're you know that that um, it, it's it's a huge problem to through you know the scores that get generated in students too. So those those hey, principles still remain key. Yeah. Gabriel, hey, just uh, for your information, we were. Uh, my company is ITEP, and we were giving our tests under secure conditions in in uh, uh, in uh, uh, rooms throughout the world, uh, so test centers. And of course, they were all closed uh, two months ago. And uh, so, one of the things that I tell you, we did, and I don't know if you can do this. And we decided uh, you can take the test at home because you have no choice. We have no choice but to offer the test at home. And we uh, used to uh, take the photograph of the applicant, of the student test taker, maybe 10 times throughout the test. Uh, our test is about an uh, hour and 25 minutes. Uh, so now we take about 50 photos of, this, of the, so when the students, and we look at the photos to see it, as, and we tell the students, we're photographing you as you take the test. So I don't know if it's complicated to your side or whether you'd even want to consider if you're thinking of security, you just about have to be watching that student take the test. Or he, yeah. at least the, the, the test taker has to think that you're watching him take the test, okay? Yeah. Um, that, Can that, I offer one thing real quick? Please go ahead, Nicole. Okay, so especially for Gabrielle, uh, one um, thing we've done, um, this we're doing actually in a couple of days, is we've, we've created a test pool of questions. So they're all related to assessing that particular skill, but maybe the, the question is changed a little bit different. When it came to writing, there's like seven writing prompts for that same level and you don't know which writing prompt you're gonna get when you open the test. <clears throat> and the other thing that we did that I, we've instituted, especially right now, is we all of the teachers have to identify the student learning outcome for the test that they're giving so that it says, this is what I'm testing you on, and then looking at those questions directly relate to what is being tested, so what's being assessed. So that has helped, because the spring semester, we had rampant cheating, mm. and we really had to do that in the test, and we're using Zoom, so everyone opens the test. They have to have their thing going like this, and we're watching them take the test. Yeah. No. That's one of the things we've, oh, those are the only ways we've been able to kind of curtail that cheating. Yeah. And, and, and it's, I, I think, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I haven't, I, one of the things, one of the reasons why I get passionate about assessment literacy and, and, and learning about good assessment principles for me is just comes from teaching. I just became a better teacher. Certainly I became a better teacher just because I, I learned some more about assessment, but I, I think more assessment literate teachers make better decisions also. So one of the challenges that we face is just making better decisions also about the tasks. What tasks are you asking students to do? Because the tasks you, you set for them, you can minimize that cheating to some degree or, or you can make it easier or, you know, sometimes it's like, well, they're cheating a lot, but what are we asking them to do? And, and just a quick example, and I do some teaching now that it's not in the language program, but my students are doing reading and they have to write reports and they have to do two things. Summarize what you've read and provide an analysis, some commentary on it. Now you can do that, for example, in a reading program. You have a short reading. Number one is, and they're writing, so summarize it. I want you to summarize what are there, the main ideas. And of course you teach them how to summarize. And then I want your opinion, your analysis about it. And you set that task. And like I know for my students, there's no website or anything that they can go to that's going to help them with that. 
they have to they have to go ahead and read it they have to process it so you can sometimes you can set up a task what the task that you're asking them to do can minimize some of those things and and uh, you know make them more valid also i think all right, everybody, we're, we're, we're kind of out of time here. It's been a very interesting hour uh, spent with you and, and learning from you and getting some different ideas and opinions. So um, we're, this is, we're getting kicked off with these now. We're gonna have them uh, once a month. So what's coming up, we're getting into assessing the productive skills. Assessing speaking and writing is coming up in the next couple of months. And then we'll, we'll get back into rubrics later. So um, please come back and join us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good evening. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.